Welcome. I'm Jenny Lawrence, a longtime member and former trustee of the New York Society Library. Before we begin, a word about the library, which was founded in 1754. In its 268 years, it has closed its doors only three significant times. During the American Revolution, briefly in a yellow fever outbreak in 1803, and during COVID's three-month lockdown in 2020. Thanks to the extraordinary leadership of Carolyn Waters and her resilient staff, the library continued operations remotely through this pandemic, which has taught us to operate in new ways. Tonight is a case in point. Because of the Omicron wave, we seamlessly moved the talk from the members room to live streaming. Going forward, we can count on our doors remaining open in some capacity, regardless of the circumstances. Now to Ted Widmer and his riveting book, Lincoln on the Verge, which is about a divided nation plunged into the deepest crisis in its history. In February, 1861, President-elect Lincoln, in advance of his March 4th inauguration, took a 13-day roundabout train route from Springfield, Illinois to Washington, D.C., visiting the capitals of the five essential states that had elected him, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey. This account of the 13-day train journey gives a vivid portrait of the country and an unknown, untried president-elect that is so fraught and momentous in Ted's retelling that it would make a compelling movie. The book was published in April 2020, before Biden's election, before Trump's challenge to his victory, and before the January 6th Capitol insurrection. I'm curious to hear his thoughts on the eerie parallels between these moments in history. I had read Lincoln on the Verge before I knew anything about the author, but I was dazzled by the astonishing level of detail. At Lincoln's stop in New York City, for example, Ted gives us not only the figures of the country's most populous city, upwards of 800,000, but the number of millionaires, 115, and even the approximate number of prostitutes, 25,000. Huge crowds greeted Lincoln, and we hear the reactions of many, for the most part, quote, not so ugly as his portraits, unquote, but also specifically from cartoonist Thomas Nast, poet Walt Whitman, diarist George Templeton Strong, and 12-year-old Augusta St. Baudens, who remembered, quote, the figure of a tall and very dark man, end quote, an impression that in 1887, he would translate into a 12-foot bronze statue, Abraham Lincoln, the man, now in Chicago's Lincoln Park. Ted is excused for overlooking one small detail. On Lincoln's six-mile route from the Hudson River's Railroad's 30th Street Depot to the Astor House Hotel at Broadway and B.C. Street, Lincoln and his party passed within a block of the newly relocated New York Society Library at 65 University Place, a thriving institution with its 1,255 members and a book collection approaching 40,000. Here it stayed until 1937 when it moved into its present home at 53 East 79th. So who is Ted Widmer? this master of astonishing detail. As an undergraduate at Harvard, he was editor of the Lampoon and then went on to get an MA and a PhD in the history and literature of France and the US, ultimately becoming a lecturer in history and literature at his alma mater. He also played guitar and vocals in a Boston hard rock band, The Upper Crust. In 1997, he left Harvard, embarking on an exceptionally diverse career path, from foreign policy speechwriter for President Bill Clinton, inaugural director of the C.V. Starr Center for the Study of American Experience at Washington College, senior advisor to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, creator and contributor to the New York Times series on the Civil War, Disunion, 
director of the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress and his current position at City University's Macaulay's Honors College here in New York. Along the way, he has authored eight books reflecting his range of interests, expertise, and the stunning fruits of his research. Lincoln on the Verge is his latest. A final note, when I read of his 2006 position as director and librarian of the John Carter Brown Library at Brown University, I recognized an aspect of Ted I had not quite figured out before, the inner librarian in him that marvelous instinct to hunt down every last particle of information. It's a wonderful quality that readers discover as they turn the pages of Lincoln on the Verge. Please welcome Ted Widmer. I've been in Rhode Island for two, almost two years now and can't wait to get back to Rhode Island and will um, immediately come over to the library and, and become a member as soon as I get there. And I, I think my friend Tom Bayonne is part of our group tonight. I see his name in the chat, and he's a wonderful librarian at the American Museum of Natural History. And I I wrote some of this book in his library, and I'd like to say I looked up books toward, the, toward my book while there. I didn't. I just liked being in his library so much that it was a great place to write. And um, so this book was assembled in various libraries around the United States uh, over about nine years. I, I think there are some railroad buffs maybe in our group from the chat, and that is thrilling because it, it did come from a sense that trains were very important. They were, they were certainly important in American history. And I, I did a ton of research on just how transformative the, the railroad was when it came into daily life in the United States in the middle decades of the 19th century really starting in the 1830s. Um, and as I was writing the book, I had a feeling that it was as transformative as the internet has been over the last 25 years in, in, in our own lives and raised many of the same questions about rapid communication and how to control that communication and how a, a government that wasn't all that powerful in the 19th century could control a force as powerful as the railroad was. Um, that was one of many topics that I was absolutely absorbed by in, in my nine years of research. Um, Jenny kindly mentioned a series of articles on the Civil War that I was a part of in the New York Times began in 2010. And our, our conceit with that series was that we would write about something that was happening 150 years ago. And I was following Lincoln pretty closely and stumbled upon the story of his train journey in February of 1861. And remembering how much I liked trains as a kid, I, I began to gravitate toward the story and I read more about it. There, there were a few books that touched upon it. So it's not as if I was the first writer ever to, to write about this journey, but I, th I thought I could do it more justice by, by focusing on the train trip as the lead story. Um, and and I, I never wavered from that decision. I, I felt that the simple story of a man in trouble riding on a train toward a very dangerous destination was inherently dramatic and, and fascinating. And it pulled us a little bit out of where a lot of Lincoln biography is in the um, political struggles he's always involved in and made it more immediate. It made the simple challenge okay. of getting- I found this on the web for Civil War that I was a part. Check him, it out. Oh, sorry, I'm getting serious talking to me. Um, the, the drama of just getting him to Washington um, was so powerful that I, I never regretted the choice to do this book, even though it took me these these nine long years to, to write it. Um, I, I, I was lucky to be based for part of the writing of this book at Brown University, which has a wonderful collection of 19th century American history and literature, and a very strong collection relating to Abraham Lincoln in, in particular, including a lot of his personal documents. Um, I also was able to spend a year at the Library of Congress, and that was 
great because of the incredible newspaper collections. And it used to be that you had to actually look at the hard copies uh, in the library to 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 know what was happening in in a city or town in the 19th century. But I I don't want to fail to mention what was a very major source for me, an incredible free online database of 19th century American newspapers called Chronicling America. And since we're all library buffs in, in this particular Zoom, I, I strongly urge you to check out Chronicling America because it's incredible. It's organized by state. So you go to the state that you're interested in and then the, the city or town and then the year and you get a full run of whatever newspaper you're looking for. And so without that much difficulty, I could read the hometown papers of every town that Lincoln went through on a railroad journey from Springfield, Illinois to Washington, D.C. And I found a lot of material that had never been described in, in books. Um, really important writing about what Lincoln's face looked like, um, remarks he made, what the uh, atmosphere, the tension was as he came through the town. And so we still, even in this very well-known story of the life of Abraham Lincoln, probably the most famous American who has ever lived, we still, thanks to libraries and new technologies, have the ability to find out more information. So I, I really dug down deep and I was blessed in a way by the, the narrowness of my, my focus. So it was only 13 days, but they were 13 really big days. And I just bore down on each day, almost minute by minute to try to figure out where Lincoln was and what he was saying. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, there, there was a growing drama in the realization of people in his entourage that there was a very serious assassination plot about which they were trying to learn information as he's racing from city to city on a train and just dealing with all of that, giving speeches to confused Americans and sending letters and telegrams to people in Washington about what his new government will, will be like. He's assembling an administration. Not the easiest thing to do, especially when seven states have just seceded from the country. He's also being warned in ever more graphic terms that uh, a, a large number of people are going to try to kill him, probably in Baltimore. So here is, as Jenny said, uh, material for a great movie that has yet to be made. There, there actually is a movie from the early 1950s that isn't very well known, but I, I, I really recommend it. I thought it was great, called The Tall Target. And it's about a train on which a murder is about to happen, but you don't know who's going to commit it or who the victim is. And at the very end of the film, there is a reveal that Lincoln was the person who they were trying to kill. And it's pretty close to, to the real story of, of what happened. Um, Lincoln is so famous and so successful. I mean, his presidency is all, almost always rated as the most successful in our history that it's really hard to remember how fragile it all was when he was coming in. And to my mind, that just makes his achievement even more extraordinary. The, the greatest president in our history had to survive the worst transition in our history. And so they're both rather extraordinary facts. And Jenny mentioned the transition of 2020 to 2021. And that was just incredible for me to live through because I had written the book, it had come out, came out in very complicated circumstances in, in COVID. I mean, one month after COVID hit, my book came out and every event I was scheduled to do was canceled. And it seemed at first like a disaster, but then over the months that followed, we began to all talk to each other on Zoom and I, I may have 
been able to speak to more people than I would have even under normal circumstances. I'm, I'm not sure, but it was all just sort of, you know, really strange for, for a, a while. But then it continued to be strange as we got through the election of 2020 and the failure to accept the election. I don't know, you know exactly what language to use, but something that really has almost, well, no, it has never happened. It has never happened in our history that a defeated candidate has claimed to be victorious. And it, in some ways it resembled the situation in 1860, but even then the defeated South, which had lost in a sense to Lincoln, they had run, I mean, you could say three candidates against him. It's a four candidate race. One of them is Stephen Douglas, who's not a Southerner, but he's he's sympathetic in some ways to the South, and the other two were Southerners, and they all lost to Lincoln. And even then, they didn't claim that they had won. They just decided they didn't want to be a part of a country that Lincoln was going to be the, the president of. Um, but then, as you all know, in November and December, and especially in January of the past year, we saw scenes that I never thought I would see in this country. Um, January 6th, of course, being the the most egregious scene, and it really did bring me back into the writing of this book and my discovery of, of just how much opposition there was to the idea that Abraham Lincoln, our greatest president, would ever actually become president. And it was not just the leaders of the quasi nation that was about to call itself the Confederate States of America, but there were a whole lot of Southern sympathizers still living in Washington, DC, a very Southern city. And just people who'd been working for the government for a long time who didn't want to see a big change because they liked their job or they liked their friends who worked alongside them. And um, in the middle of the turmoil of Lincoln's own transition, there was a meeting of Congress to certify the electoral ballots, exactly like the meeting on January 6th of this year. And an incredible scene happened. A, a, a mob did form and did want to come into the Capitol and disrupt the proceedings. And some people did get in. And some of those people were elected representatives of Congress and, and senators who were pro-South and anti-Lincoln. And it was a very close call. It was February 13th, 1861. And this was the same as January 6th of this year, the meeting to sort of formally accept the the results of the election in, in November. And on this day, the vice president of the United States, not Mike Pence, but in 1861, his name was John C. Breckinridge from Kentucky. He had actually been the South's main candidate against Lincoln. So he was the losing candidate and the sitting vice president, and it was to his office that all of the electoral certificates had been sent to be opened up on the floor of Congress. And he could easily have destroyed them or lost them or, or something and thrown the election into Congress where Lincoln would have been at a disadvantage, but he didn't. He was a future Confederate cabinet member and a confederate general so he he was about as confederate as you get but on the day to meet to certify lincoln's electoral certificates he acted like a, a patriotic american the word patriot has been abused a lot in the last year or two but he acted like a, a real patriot and he put lincoln's election and, and the well-being of the American people above his own short-term political needs. And Lincoln was certified and and won. He was already en route. He was in Ohio when he got the result that he actually had been certified. So that was just one of um, hundreds of little dramas that I discovered by my, my close focus on 13 days in February 1861, days in which Lincoln was elected 
president-elect, but it was far from certain that he would become the actual president of the United States. So to my immense happiness, I stumbled upon a great story. It's really hard to find a new Lincoln story. It's hard to find a new story in any category, um, but that's why we love libraries. They hold all of the stories and they reward the diligent reader and, and researcher. So my, my book was a kind of a love affair with libraries and I, I miss many of them. I miss certain collections where I discovered something interesting. Um, I don't want to talk too long at the outset because I have about 30 slides to show you. So may, maybe Sarah, at this point, we can go to the slides um, and I'll try to go through them reasonably quickly so we can have a conversation. Um, so, okay, if we go to the next one. This is the scene on the day of Lincoln's inauguration, March 4th, 1861. But by the way, we're the one year anniversary of Joe Biden's inauguration today, which makes it feel a little bit uh, more special. Um, you can see the Capitol is unfinished, the dome is incomplete, and that's what everything felt like. Washington was uh, a city in a lot of chaos with um, new people coming in, old people going out, and nobody quite knew who was in charge of, of the government of the United States of America. Um, okay. There's a close-up of Lincoln on the stand uh, as he's uh, giving his first inaugural address, the famous speech about the, the better angels of our nature. Okay. And here is that speech. Uh, the Library of Congress holds the manuscript that he was holding as he gave the speech. And like the city of Washington, it's it's kind of incomplete and coming together. Um, he did multiple printings of it on en route to Washington. He almost lost his only copy of the speech. Uh, he, he gave it to his son in a briefcase and his son put it in a hotel baggage hold. And there was a, a brief moment of terror when they thought they might've lost the only copy of the speech, but they, they found it. But even as he was um, going in the final days before giving the speech, he was rewriting it and, and, um, the, the best section of all the final paragraph came in collaboration with William Seward, former governor of New York and senator from New York, who um, helped him to write the beautiful phrase about the better angels. Um, okay. Here he is in Springfield, Illinois, on May 20th, 1860. It's two days after he won the nomination to everyone's amazement. He was not that well known a politician. All he had ever been really was a one-term congressman 12 years earlier. And, you know, now, like then, that isn't a very big accomplishment. <clears throat> but he had positioned himself well on the slavery debate. He was anti-slavery, but he wasn't quite radical enough to be called an abolitionist. And that was where most Americans in the North were in 1860. Um, this beautiful photograph is held by the Metropolitan Museum of Art, by the way. Uh, okay. This is a famous Matthew Brady port photograph of Lincoln taken in, in New York uh, on Lower Broadway in February of 1860 when he came to New York to give the Cooper Union speech at um, the Cooper Institute in Astor Place. And it wasn't just that the speech was very well received and, and, and a very good speech and a very well researched speech that made Lincoln seem erudite and elegant, things that people didn't usually think of Abraham Lincoln as. But he also did himself a huge favor by taking this dignified portrait that was immediately circulated around the country and made a gangly Illinoisan who had not gone to college suddenly seem semi-presidential. I think the next image is uh, uh, the same thing in Harper's Weekly. Yeah, so this is how a lot of Americans were perceiving Abraham Lincoln in the early months of 1860. Not yet the nominee, but, a, but rising, rising from the West, further West than any president had ever come from, by the way. Um, okay, this is uh, July 1860, a very beautiful 
photograph of, of Lincoln, with a lot of uh, texture to it, if you can ever see it up close. There's a wonderful book, some of you may know, that came out in, I think, 1979, called The Face of Lincoln. It's an oversized book and filled with um, gorgeous, deeply detailed copies of these photographs that um, I think I got in 1979 and I, uh, my parents gave it to me for Christmas. And I, I, I think that gift of a book all those years ago was still forming me as I was thinking about writing this book. So that's another reason to give books to, to children. Um, okay. Uh, this is the a, a photograph that only was discovered a few years ago. It's of a column being lifted into place in the Capitol, the building without a dome. On And in small letters, you can't quite see it here, but um, small letters, it says November 6th, 1860, and that is the day of Lincoln's election. So it's a powerful metaphor for a government that's trying to come together. Uh, okay. Um, here's the, not only the unfinished capital, but what was called the city canal in front of it um, on the west front, which is where the, the January 6th rioters walked up to go up the capital. Um, and, and in 1860, it was a really pretty vile body of water with dead animals and insects above it and terrible smells that you could smell in in the Senate and, and Congress. So just another image about how incomplete Washington was at the time. Uh, okay. So here is Lincoln in late November, 1860. He has been elected the president of the United States and he makes a remarkable decision. Uh, no other president before or since has done this, but he decides to change his appearance after winning the presidency and begins to grow a beard, which you can just see coming in. Um, and this is the cover image of, of my book. And I just thought it was so interesting to see Lincoln still in formation, kind of like Washington, DC. Uh, okay. Uh, this is a wonderful story, but I probably shouldn't tell it in too much detail because I wanna keep moving so we can ask questions. But um, I was really happy to bring in a few women into this story. And, you know, most Civil War stories do not have many women, but mine does. And the first of them is this uh, remarkable woman named Dorothea Dix, who was born in what is now Maine and then grew up in Massachusetts and became a reformer. And she did a few different things. She tried to reform women's prisons, but she also became an advocate for mental health and the building of mental hospitals around the country. And she was well liked in the South as well as the North because she helped Southern states also to deal with their mental health issues. And while traveling in the South in the fall of 1860, she picked up very clear intelligence about an assassination plot to take Lincoln's life as he came through Maryland on the way to Washington. And um, being a self-starter, she found the one person she thought could do something about it. And that is the next slide. Um, this was a man named Samuel Felton, who was the head of the railroad that connected Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington. And she went into his office without an appointment and told him about this assassination plot. And that was the beginning of the effort to save Lincoln's life, to, to prevent the assassins from killing him. Um, oh, okay, next slide. This is just for li librarians and bibliophiles. Samuel Felton earlier in his career, 20 years earlier, had been a local railroad uh, builder in Massachusetts, and he built the train line. You can see it in the upper right hand corner that went adjacent to Walden Pond. And Henry Thoreau writes about the railroad in Walden. And it's always struck me as kind of funny that this guy is trying to escape civilization and he chooses a pond that has a railroad right next to it. So it's not quite as secluded as, as he led us to believe. Um, okay. 
So this is the railroad Felton was in charge of uh, from Philadelphia down to Baltimore and then ultimately to Washington. And you can see there are a lot of little bodies of water that the train bridges went over. And there was a fear that uh, one of those bridges would be sabotaged with, with explosives and would kill Lincoln um, a, as he went over it. Uh, okay. So Felton hires the man on the left standing with Lincoln is Alan Pinkerton, a detective who worked on railroads. He was a Scottish immigrant and Lincoln actually knew him. He was based in Chicago and he was famous for being a very good railroad detective. So all of this action was happening with railroad people. Lincoln was going to be on a train and the train, uh, a railroad president in Philadelphia worked through his own network of railroad detectives to find the best detective in America to protect Lincoln. So that was Pinkerton and Pinkerton came east to meet with, with Felton and was hired and he brought eight operatives with him. Um, they, they were spies, basically undercover agents to infiltrate the assassins in Baltimore and find out what the actual attempt would look like and then prevent it from happening. Okay. One of Pinkerton's agents was another woman named Kate Warney, who is a real heroine of my story. She was in her late twenties, not very old. She was already a widow and she was a brilliant impersonator. And she impersonated a woman from Alabama, went around Baltimore and just sort of sat near people who seemed pro-Southern and within days had gotten all of the information about the plot. And Pinkerton trusted her so much that he sent her to meet with Lincoln and, and tell him everything that she knew. And she, on the last night of the journey, rode in Lincoln's tiny passenger compartment with, with him, protecting him. Uh, oh. Thank you. Um, so the trip begins on February 11th, 1861 in Springfield, Lincoln's hometown, where he extemporaneously gives a very beautiful speech to his fellow citizens that show this sort of deeper Lincoln beginning to come into view. I mean, there are all these parallel stories, not only the danger, but Lincoln is growing a lot as a speaker while he's on this extremely difficult train trip. So here with no notes in front of him, uh, with not very much time, 30 seconds or so, he gives one of the most moving speeches of his life. And because of the telegraph lines that went along the train tracks, those words were beamed back to every city in America within minutes of his saying them. And he had done himself a huge favor. He, he seemed different from other politicians. He seemed deeply human. He talked about how much he loved living with his fellow citizens. He talked about how they had known a lot of loss together, including the loss of his child. And it was a, a personal speech, like nothing that had ever been said by a president. And I, I've, I actually got interested in that question. And I, I tried to find anything personal that any president had ever said before this small speech, and I, I still have not found anything like it. So it was a real breakthrough. Um, okay. So in city after city, huge crowds, as Jenny mentioned. Here he is in Cleveland. Um, it's a great image, but I didn't reproduce it well, so you can't see it very well. But Lincoln is a tiny stick figure on a balcony under a huge flag, and there are tens of thousands of people gathered around just desperate to hear any word from him because they know the entire future of the united states depends on his decisions will we go to war or not will we be two countries or or one will slavery be ended or or not absolutely huge issues and nobody knew the answer yet This is a photo I liked uh, also in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, just a, a stretch of train track in upstate New York. As I got deeper into the writing of this book, something really interesting happened to me. I stopped always looking at Lincoln, which I had been doing, and I began to try to imagine what he was looking at, what it looked like outside the train window. And that 
I think, deepen the book. It made it more fun for me. I really looked at every city that he went through and I tried to describe what they looked like. And they're all different. They're all incredibly interesting and, and a, you know, a really deep satisfaction for me was realizing that Cleveland, Columbus, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Buffalo are cities as full of interest as Florence, Paris, Rome, London, Berlin. You know, they're just our, our cities. And they, they were absolutely fascinating, growing very fast with different industries. And I, I tried to capture some of that. Um, okay. Here is a, a quick pencil sketch that Thomas Nast, who uh, Jenny mentioned, did upon arrival in New York's train station, which was uh, near the current Penn Station, but a few blocks to the west, um, near some buildings that are sort of in back of the old Farley post office. That's where he came in. And uh, Nast was there and saw Lincoln for the first time, becomes a very important caricaturist of Lincoln, but this was the very first time he saw him. And a uh, quick library story, I found these in the Rare Books Library of Brown University. They had never been seen, and they were on the uh, flip side of a document that was um, in a scrapbook, taped, taped the wrong side up. And by asking a librarian if I could look at the obverse, uh, we re realized there was this incredibly important Lincoln drawing there. So thank you, librarians. Um, okay, here he is uh, on the balcony of the Astor Place Hotel, which was New York's most elegant hotel on Broadway near City Hall, where, where City Hall still is, Lower Broadway, um, near Park Place. And uh, Lincoln gave a short speech, as he did so often, and Walt Whitman was in the crowd, and Whitman was a very good witness for me and described what it felt like to be there and how dangerous Whitman felt it was, even in New York, that he felt there were a lot of people with guns and knives who just did not want Lincoln to make it to Washington. Uh, okay. This is the only photograph from the entire trip in Philadelphia outside Independence Hall. Lincoln raised a huge flag and gave a very beautiful speech about what the Declaration of Independence meant to him. And I, I mentioned his speeches kept getting bigger, and he deployed American history brilliantly, even though he's, you know, barely a politician, just one term as congressman. He had a very deep appreciation of American history, and he really outmaneuvered Jefferson Davis, who's already the president of the Confederacy and former general and senator, but didn't know history very well. And history is a powerful tool for for uh imaginative politicians and lincoln really showed that so he, in in this spot lincoln lincoln scored another big uh big victory um these brass knuckles are in the collection of ford um the, the ford theater in washington they were held by alan pinkerton who rode with lincoln and and kate warney on the last night of the trip okay um that's a map of Baltimore where they thought that the if it if they didn't blow up his train going over a bridge, they were going to try to get him in downtown Baltimore as he transferred from one station to the next. There was there were three stations in Baltimore, and you had to transfer, and that's that's where he was vulnerable. Uh, okay. Oh, and in Baltimore, uh, it's the same city where Frederick Douglass walked onto a train disguised as a sailor to escape slavery. And as Lincoln is coming through on the last night of his trip, like Douglas, he had to um, disguise himself. Uh, he didn't have, uh, it was often rumored he wore women's clothes. He didn't, but he wore a different hat and jacket than he usually wore. And he sat in a small passenger compartment with Alan Pinkerton and Kate Warney. Um, and I think knew a lot of the fear that Frederick Douglass felt as he was traveling north from Baltimore. So it's Lincoln actually sort of understood the feeling of a slave escaping on a, on a train. And this is the station he came into in Washington. Uh, it's a little bit up the hill from where the current Union Station is. It's, you can see how close it was to the Capitol. So he came in here at dawn on February 23rd. 
1861 and a carriage was there to, to meet him. Um, and Washington DC was absolutely flabbergasted that he had arrived because the, the word was out that his, his incoming journey was going to be extremely hazardous. And so when he walked off the train, he scored another victory. He made his enemies look foolish. All of their boasts that they were going to kill him proved to be untrue. And by surviving this train trip, he had done a great deal to make his presidency real. And I think at the beginning of his trip, it wasn't that real. But by the time he survived the, the odyssey of the 13 days, he had taken a very big step toward becoming Abraham Lincoln. Um, I think I just have a few more. This is a photograph taken the day after he arrived, designed to make it look like everything was stable and normal, and uh, the transition was happening as, as could be expected. But I'm always a little amused by this because I know how harrowing the journey was, but the point was to reassure the public, and this photograph did. Um, this photograph I love. It's March 4th, 1865. It was taken by a photographer in New York City I think kind of close to University Place, Jenny, so maybe near the Society Library then, but it's by um, a photographer named Lewis Rutherford and it's of the moon. It's an incredibly vivid and focused photograph of the moon on the day Lincoln took his second uh, oath of office and gave his beautiful second inaugural address. And I, I, you know, I like photographs, so I just added it to the back of the book. I think we might have one or two more. And so here's Lincoln, so important symbolically to us a hundred years later. Um, this is the day Martin Luther King gave the I Have a Dream speech in the March on Washington, August 28th, 1963. And so Lincoln's survival of the 13 days meant not only that his presidency would become real, but that all of the incredible achievements of the Civil War, um, the defeat of a radical insurrection against the United States, the crushing of the old plantation oligarchy, and the emancipation of the slaves, all of those huge things happened because Lincoln survived his train trip. And they're still happening. I mean, we we backslide as a nation, and Martin Luther King began his great speech by saying we stand in the symbolic shadow of a great American. And so these stories are not over. They're still happening. Um, there may be one more. I can't quite remember. There might be one more photograph, but that might be the last one. Nope, that was it. So um, good. I'm I'm done, and I'm really eager to hear your questions and, and comments. So feel free to ask away. Hello, thank you so much. I'm Sarah Holiday from the library and I will be visible in here in just a moment. There we are. Um, thank you for that really wonderful presentation. And some of those photos, I think I may speak for many of us when I say, I've looked at a lot of photos of President Lincoln, but there were some in there I hadn't seen before. And of course the Thomas Nast thing, which is so special to have found. So, um, Thank you so much. Um, so audience, thank you also for joining us this evening. Um, you will see the chat on the right of your screen, most likely. If you wanna add in your questions, comments, uh, book recommendations, anything related to the subject at hand, um, we will present them to the speaker, but I'm gonna jump in with a couple of things that I wondered about. Um, so I know that uh, George Templeton Strong was in New York City at this time, and he was a member of this library. And also we had a little uh, online presentation about him last year in the anniversary of um, his birth, I think it was. Can you talk a little bit about what, if anything, he said about Lincoln at the time? He's a great witness to everything in New York City. I, I believe his journals are in the New York Historical Society. Um, I saw them once many years ago. He writes in a very small hand, um, but they're, they're just wonderful. And he was very helpful to me. He saw Lincoln um, go, go by. Lincoln went in his horse and carriage parade. He went down uh, from the train station to Union Square and then down Broadway 
a long way, all the way down to City Hall, where the, the hotel was. Um, and as if I'm right, I think George Templeton Strong was around Houston, Houston and Broadway, and saw Lincoln go by and caught a quick glimpse of him and wrote something sort of a little bit tart and funny. I, I wish I could remember the exact words, but I, I can't. Um, but he was representative of a very important kind of a person, a person who didn't like what the South was doing and how long the South had sort of controlled everything. They really did have a stranglehold on the presidency, but it wasn't all the way to abolitionism either. He was a conservative kind of person, a businessman who wanted business to keep going, but was ashamed of the United States, a self-proclaimed democracy uh, running on slavery. It just was a, a contradiction that he found morally troubling. So Lincoln was good at speaking to people like that. Lincoln, you know, the very same thing that sometimes causes people to criticize Lincoln today, it's a complicated topic, but we can we can talk about it, is that he wasn't more radical right away, that he didn't just abolish slavery immediately. But if he had been that kind of a person, he would not have been elected. He needed to reassure the sort of vast middle of America that he was wise and prudent and, and would respect institutions. And so he did turn out to end slavery and, and, and you know, that was a wonderful thing, but he had to do it in the sequence that he, he did it. And I often find it frustrating when people ignore context and just say Lincoln, you know, should have been more abolitionist than, than he, he was. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, George Templeton Strong is great. And his, his, I think four diary books of his diaries are just such a good window into New York City in the middle of the 19th century, the best window. Maybe Whitman in his own way is as good. They're very different, but just for daily life and what it's like to walk down the streets of Manhattan, Strong is incredible. Yeah, Strong and Whitman, kind of two ends of some spectrum yeah. in New York City at the time. That's great. Um, so great question in the chat here. If Lincoln had been assassinated during that train journey, who would have become president? It is a great question. Um, I think probably Hannibal Hamlin, but nothing like that had ever happened. No president had been assassinated. And to this day, no president, no president elect has died. That would be a very strange situation. William Henry Harrison dies just after becoming president, but no president elect has yet died. And I assume that would mean the vice president elect would become president. But, you know, as we're discovering, there are a lot of sort of um, potholes in our, our system. And Congress does have a fair amount of power. And I wonder, I, I wonder without knowing if in a situation like that, if Congress might have taken the power to to declare the election void because the president was no longer, the president elect was no longer alive and choose a new president from among its its members. I think it's theoretically possible, but I'm, I'm not certain. Well, tantalizing, but good thing that didn't come up. Um, someone says, wow, what an amazing story, which I think we're all in agreement with, um, and goes on, I wonder, did the Buchanan administration do anything at all to coordinate with Lincoln and ensure a safe transition? Good question. Uh, not much. They were really in a kind of free fall, and that was also fascinating to me. I mean, my main story was Lincoln, but I... I was fascinated by how bad things were getting in Washington as he was coming in. So Buchanan is from Pennsylvania, which is a you know pretty northern state, but he was quite pro-Southern, even though he's a Pennsylvanian. And his cabinet was a little more pro-Southern than pro-Northern, although it had a few people from each section. Um, and they began to, like the Civil War itself, his cabinet began to fracture, I mean, just like the country. And the pro-Southern members of the cabinet were very aggressive. And 
there were fears that they might even try to kidnap Buchanan. That's how bad it was getting in the final weeks of December. So you can't say very much that's good about Buchanan. He wasn't ever a very good president. And he seems to have, I mean, I think it would be fair to say he had a an episode of some kind of dementia or mental disease or something. He, he fell apart in, a, in the crisis of secession, which begins on his watch. So South Carolina secedes in December of 1860, and he, he begins to fall apart. He can't handle the crisis. And people describing him say he has like a, a facial twitch and he's not good in, in meetings. And he wasn't really even capable of coordinating with Lincoln and, and didn't. But the best thing you can probably say about Buchanan is he, he didn't really do anything horrible either. He just sat there and nothing happened and the situation got worse. But by the time Lincoln arrived, Buchanan hadn't recognized the Confederacy, which he might have done. You know, Buchanan was the president. He could have said, I accept South Carolina's secession. And they might have exchanged ambassadors between two different countries. And Buchanan didn't do anything. So that made it more possible for Lincoln to fix everything when he when he came in. The best choice, but as you yeah. said, um, good, a great question here. I was also curious about this. Um, can you tell us much about Kate Warney's life after her assignment protecting Lincoln? I, I wish I could. I can't tell you very much. Um, there are a couple books about Alan Pinkerton, and she appears briefly in those books, but not much is known about her. Um, but there's one detail that's really moving. Uh, she she died not too many years in the future after protecting Lincoln. And Pinkerton obviously felt something very powerful for her, which I don't have any reason to think it was a romantic attraction. I think it was just at respect but he buried her in his own family plot in Chicago. They're, they're buried together with other members of Pinkerton's family. So I think she was a very special person, but she didn't leave a memoir. Um, all we really have, she wrote these short and incredibly um, efficient, the way I think she was, reports to Pinkerton, as she was guarding Lincoln, she was sending telegrams back to Pinkerton about what was happening. So that's the only representation of her voice that that we have. But she's just so interesting. I really feel like somebody needs to make an epic film about her. Yeah, that, you know, that maybe that's the movie is Kate Warney. I, by the way, I'm saying Warney because there's an E at the end, but I don't actually know. It could be Warn. I'm not sure. Great. This is outstanding. Uh, audience members, uh, time for another question or two if you have some to toss in. I was also wondering, um, so you read many, many 19th century newspapers. Um, did it give you a new perspective on modern journalism? Or is there anything else you'd like to say about 19th century newspapers in general? No, I miss, I actually prefer 19th century newspapers in a lot of ways. There's so much color. I mean, not not literal color. It's all black and white, but the writing is so alive. And if they're angry, they're going to tell you they're angry. And if they want to tell you a funny joke, they'll just tell it right there. Newspapers were entertainment, among other things. You know, there are paintings of people reading newspapers, sitting on porches of taverns and all laughing. And I think, you know, before, way before television, newspapers filled some of that space. And once you get used to it, you start reading them all the time, that, that personality really comes through. And I, I think we, you know, we've turned newspapers into something quite different. I mean, I, I know there were good reasons, objectivity, neutrality, but a very objective newspaper can also be a boring newspaper. And, um, in the 19th century, you don't have that feeling. They're just so, they're pulsing with life. And as Lincoln comes through, everybody knows it's the, the biggest story of the past 
So another good question here, were there briefing books prepared for Lincoln to read on the journey? Was he catching up on? That is a good question. Um, he was writing to friends in Washington. So he, he was sending letters and receiving them back about what's going, Seward, for example, was very helpful to Lincoln. And there were some Illinoisans who were in Washington who were helpful to him. But it took a while to send and receive a, a letter. Um, telegrams were faster and were actually, you know, pretty instantaneous, which, which helps us to understand how fast things were changing in 1861. That he he could send a telegram in an amount of time that was not too much more than it would be for us to make a phone call or send an email. So, but those were very short. You couldn't put a lot of words in a, in a telegram. Um, and as far as a, a, a book, I don't know that he had anything like that, but he was in dialogue with fellow Republican leaders. It was a real crisis for the Republican Party because it was only about five years old and it had never won an election. So it was the first time they were assembling a, a cabinet and they were building everything from scratch. So. Really, the, the degree of difficulty at the beginning of Lincoln's presidency was absolutely immense. And I think restating that gives us even more admiration for what, what he achieved. Absolutely. Um, splendid. Well, I think we've got room for maybe one more question if somebody has one to toss in. Um, is there anything that you would like to add or a favorite anecdote that you haven't gotten to share that you'd like to share with us? Oh, gosh. Um, I'm trying to decide right now whether I do more Abraham Lincoln or find a different century. And I'm leaning a little bit toward a new century. So that's not quite an anecdote, but I'm spending a lot of time reading in um, World War II stories and also stories of the 1960s. So very, very different times from Abraham Lincoln's. But I'm beginning to go back into libraries or or to read things online and and i'm just so grateful to librarians they're so smart and i i mean it's not just the institutions that i i love but the people who work in them just know the collections so well and i i got a lot of great tips in in this book from librarians who told me there was some document i ought to go look at and they were always right so I will hopefully see many of you in the in the actual building of the New York Society Library, and I, I I do promise to join when I come back, which I think is going to be in about two or three weeks, not too many more four weeks. So we will look forward to seeing you. Um, so we do have one one more question, which maybe we can sort of wrap up with, if that sounds good. Um, how was the time between Lincoln's arrival in D.C. and the inauguration? It was pretty hectic. So he he got in safely and was taken to the Willard Hotel, which is now in the news again as the place where the January 6th plot was being coordinated, it, it seems like. Um, so Lincoln was in there and there were constant people trying to get at him, not so much for assassination anymore as jobs. Uh, as the incoming president, he had a lot of patronage he could he could dispense and so he um oh i see a note my my good friend clara bingham was on the call and i didn't i didn't know that but um he could give out jobs so he was just besieged but he, he by this point had an armed guard outside his room so he was safer than he had been on on the train and he was still working out his his inaugural i showed you the document where he his handwriting is on the bottom, and that was all coming pretty late in, in the process. Um, and there were still serious problems in the Buchanan presidency, um, the, the biggest one being Fort Sumter in, in the harbor outside Charleston, South Carolina, and whether to send supplies to the U.S. soldiers guarding that fort from South Carolinians who wanted to fire on it. And so there was a lot of tension. It, it was from February 23rd to March 4th, 1861. So he had to get through about 10 days, but but he made it. Yeah. Splendid. Um, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Of people are commenting, absolutely fascinating story. Thank you so much. Good luck with all future books. Very much a sentiment we'd echo here.
thank you so much. Thank you.